Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Braw. For those standing, feel free to take one of the two chairs that are left, three chairs, four chairs, four chairs left for more than four people. So it's the survival of the fittest. Uh, I'm a senior fellow here at AEI, and it's a, a great pleasure to be hosting this discussion today about defending our economies, our Western economies, against Chinese unfair practices. I say it's a pleasure because the discussion will be fantastic. The subject is obviously less, uh, uh, less positive, but we are here to try to solve it in, in 75 minutes. And to, to that end, I have a fantastic panel with me. And I will start by introducing uh, Federico Balsari, who will translate because uh, uh, for his benefit and the benefit of Senator Urso, we will make stops every now and then. Uh, so uh, that's Federico, uh, who is a foreign, uh, foreign policy expert in his own right. Uh, then we have Congressman uh, Lahood uh, from Ohio. And I should mention that in Ohio, they get people uh, look younger as they age. So, um, so Congressman Turner is now this young. Um, he has been pulled into um, a classified meeting, so he will be replaced by uh, Adam Howard, who is the staff director of the House Intelligence Committee. He will be speaking shortly. Um, Congressman LaHood is um, a former federal prosecutor and has a number of congressional appointments, uh, which I, I won't recite except to mention that he's on the uh, Ways and Means Committee and also on the House Soccer Caucus, which I think we all appreciate. Uh, and then we have my colleague Derek Scissors, uh, who is a fantastic China scholar and uh, uh, runs the China Global Investment Tracker, which I encourage you all to, to utilize. Uh, of course, uh, to his left, Senator Adolfo Uso from Italy, who to his uh, credit is a former journalist, but even more to his credit uh, is a former longtime minister in several Berlusconi governments uh, in charge. Uh, he was in charge of trade and is now the chairman of the Italian Intelligence Committee, uh, Parliament Intelligence Committee. And then uh, James Palmer, uh, the ed uh, deputy editor of uh, Foreign Policy magazine and the editor of the China newsletter published by Foreign Policy, which I encourage everybody to subscribe to. It's fantastic. And author of two books about China. Um, so with that, I will turn the floor over to uh, Congressman LaHood. But uh, this is just to say that... Uh, uh, well, it's a pleasure to have you all here, uh, whether you're in the room or online. And feel free, if you're online, to tweet your questions uh, at um, hashtag Intel Events AEI uh, or to email them. You will see the email address on your screen. And of course, if you're in the room, you will be able to raise your hand because it's, uh, uh, it's once again possible to have meetings in person, which uh, is a, a fantastic uh, privilege. So with that, over to you. Over to you. Sorry. <laughs> Over to you, Adam, and I will yield the floor. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you, AI, for inviting us here today in what is the first installment of our Beyond the Skiff series. And I think it is very timely that our first topic today with Congressman Darren LaHood is defending Western economies against unfair, trade, unfair practices by uh, China. But before we get to that topic, um, I want to kind of give you guys an update on where the intelligence community is looking forward to doing and where we have been changing over the last couple of months uh, under the new leadership of Congressman Turner uh, on the Republican side. What we are trying to do is refocus the intelligence committee back to the intelligence community on having oversight in the intelligence community and then also specifically looking at what uh, policies and what uh, solutions we can have to the threats that are facing our nation and facing our globe right now. But before, uh, like I said, before we go into uh, Congressman Lewis' presentation here uh, and panel, um, I want to talk about one of the key components that we're doing, and that is reconnecting the intelligence to the policy making uh, committee and to Congress as a whole. With that, we're asking for your help. Uh, we are engaging experts in the national security field throughout the nation, throughout D DC, throughout academia, through other third parties. And we want your help. We want your ideas. We want your participation. And as we formulate our plan 
to look at these threats that are facing our nation and across the globe. We want to get this, like I said, we're refocusing getting our committee back to its core mission, which is national security and intelligence. And while most of what we do in the SCIF, we are looking to go beyond that, as I was saying. So as we look at doing more of these, we're asking not just AI's help, but other think tanks in the community, um, please reach out to us. Please, we want to have that interaction. We want to have that dialogue going forward. So before we go into this again, thank you again, Elizabeth. Thank you, AI. It's good to see everybody here actually in person. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Congressman Darren LaHood, who represents the 18th Congressional District of Illinois and has been a member of the committee for the last couple of years and look forward to hearing this panel on this very uh, timely topic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Adam. Uh, and I want to thank AEI for allowing us to be here for this very important topic and discussion here today. Elizabeth, thank you and Derek uh, for hosting us and look forward to your questions and comments as it relates to China. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, very proud and honored to serve on the House Intelligence Committee and also on the Ways and Means Committee. I serve on the Trade Subcommittee. The Ways and Means Committee has sole jurisdiction over all trade matters. And so when we think about the relationship with China, uh, obviously that trade relationship is important economically. Um, I also uh, would just, um, uh, acknowledge everybody in the room here. I look forward uh, to your engagement uh, on these important topics. I also want to thank Senator Urso uh, for traveling from Italy to bring his perspective uh, from Europe. Uh, obviously, um, many of the democracies of the world and the rules-based systems, uh, Italy being one of them, they're important as we look at uh, China. Uh, China, from my perspective, is an existential threat in many ways, from a national security standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from a trade standpoint, from a cyber standpoint. I say this often, China has a plan to replace us, uh, a plan to replace us economically, militarily, you go down the list there. Uh, but we also, um, we're tied to them economically. Um, they have a middle class of roughly 600 million. At every level, we are tied economically to China. I think about my own district in central Illinois. I have the eighth largest ag district in the country. About a third of the corn and soybeans that grow, that my farmers grow, go to China every year. Caterpillar, I have the largest concentration of Caterpillar workers anywhere in the world. So in my district, we make a lot of engines and D10 tractors and excavators. Uh, and, and Caterpillar is a wonderful American company. But they have 29 manufacturing plants in China for R&D facilities. And you go through those iconic American companies that have an imprint in China. And so we hear a lot in the Congress now about going to a Cold War mentality. And I hope our panelists here can talk about that. There is, there is a movement to go to a Cold War mentality as it relates to China. And there's many uh, reasons for doing that. I look back historically, I've only been in Congress for seven years, but if you go back and look at when China was led into the World Trade Organization in 2001, what was the argument at the time? Bring China into the World Trade Organization, they're gonna modernize, they're gonna become more westernized, they're gonna become more like America in rules-based system. Now, there are a few pockets of areas where I think you can find that, but overall, they have not adapted uh, to the rules-based system, right? They continue to steal our intellectual property. They continue to not buy, by, abide by the same rules and standards that every other industrialized country in the world does. And there is example after example after example of that. So what is the engagement we should be involved with? And that's part of what today is all about. And so um, I, I believe uh, there, are, um, there are efforts uh, in the Congress where we can address these issues. Um, I currently sit on the conference committee for the, depends on what you want to call it now, the, the Competes Act or the Endless Frontiers Act or USICA, or I just call it the China Bill, right? So, uh, but, but that's one step forward depending on how you look at it, on how you confront China. And there's many other ways as it relates to, again, IP theft, as it relates to cyber, as it relates to national security. And so I'm hopeful that the conversation today, we can talk about those issues uh, that I just raised here. And so again, in my role on the Intelligence Committee, I want to thank um, uh, our, our Republican leader, Mike Turner, who has really stepped up the Intelligence Committee in terms of our engagement with people like you and think tanks like AEI on these important subjects, because we're not going to solve all the problems. So I'm grateful for uh, Representative Turner and the work that he's doing here. So um, with that, um, I'm going to open up with uh, a couple uh, questions here. Um, and maybe um, uh, first question uh, maybe, Derek, I'll start with you. 
as we look at, um, uh, and, and by the way, let, let me just mention one other thing. I think if you went back in the Congress 20 years ago, you used to have kind of these separate uh, folks involved with China. You had human rights hawks, you had economics hawks, and you had national security hawks. Well, they've all found each other now. They've all found each other in the Congress, uh, and they're united against China, right? Uh, and, and so we have this, this kind of um, this mentality that transcends politics in a lot of way and what to do about China. So when we think about that and the movement toward a Cold War mentality, maybe, Derek, I'll start out with you on um, the, the, the movement towards a Cold War mentality. and What does that mean for the economics of the United States-China relationship and where we're headed? Make breaks for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I apologize. Derek, for that. Derek, just a reminder not to get agitated and start talking really, really fast like I normally do. Uh, I will try not to. Um, so, you know, we have been talking now, I think, for about six years uh, about this issue, right? It, it, you know, as, as somebody who was working on China for a long time, it elevated in 2015 and 2016. And people will say we have a consensus on China, and as, as Congressman Lahoud just said, there is a consensus that we, we can't have business as usual. But as you know, sir, as we know in this room, there's not a consensus on what to do. Whenever it comes down to, to, for the rubber to meet the road, people say, well, not that. I really want to do something about China. Well, not, not that. Um, and so I, I think at some point the U.S. is going to have to decide there is an economic gain from continuing to engage China. There's no argument about that. It's not just one company. It's a lot of companies. It benefits workers and stockholders. But there are also economic costs. Uh, we, they've been mentioned already. When you engage with China as a company, your IP is at risk. Uh, if they steal your IP, the, a, a Chinese uh, rival gets subsidized to drive you out of business. Right? You're a target just as much as you are a partner. Um, and then we have the, the human rights problems, which, in my view, have clearly gotten worse under Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping, the General Secretary of the Communist Party, who wishes to remain General Secretary indefinitely. So we're not going to get a break with somebody new in charge. Uh, and we have a national security problem, which naturally arises because China, uh, China has become more militarily capable. And now they have the idea that they can take Taiwan by force. Not arguing that they want to or that they will, but 15 years ago they couldn't. Now they might be able to. Um, so I think the U.S., you know, my general answer to you, sir, is we're going to have to decide at some point that the economics, in my view, isn't worth it. There is a gain, and there are going to be costs. You know, I always say to people about this, this is not like breaking up with Belize or Belgium or, you know, I always pick B countries for whatever reason. Um, there are going to be costs, and, and we haven't yet, I think, decided to pay them. And I think we're going to have to because Xi Jinping isn't going to leave. He isn't going to change. And the last 10 years um, may, be, may have been more pleasant than the next 10 years will be. Thank you for that, Derek. Um, James, maybe I'll have you comment on that before I turn to Senator Urso. So when we say that there's a consensus on China, what we really mean is that there's a political consensus. There isn't a business consensus. There's still an enormous gap between where the American business community is and where uh, politics as a whole is at this point. And this is because... China has become very, very skilled at working American business. Skilled at working American business through both genuine incentives and through the kind of social, um, effectively exploiting the social capital and ego of American business leaders. And we see this in multiple ways. You know, on the one hand, you have this genuine gravitational pull of the Chinese market, this huge attraction that you know, 1.3 billion customers has always held uh, and has held since the 19th century for um, American business. You know, these, these dreams that this could be transformed into an Americanized market and that by doing so, China could be civilized or lifted up, which in the 19th century was seen as Christian missionization in the kind of euphoria of the post-Cold War 1990s was seen as accession to the democratic world, to international norms and standards. And that dream has always been frustrated by the Chinese end, because the Chinese don't necessarily want that for multiple reasons, some good, some bad. So you have, and there is, you know, this genuine, like, still, even, even at these times, that it's still the possibility for enormous profits in China. But, and those enormous profits remain continually tempting, 
And we can see how tempting they are by the fact that American businesses stay committed even after all the stuff they take from the CCP. And we've seen this over and over again. We've seen um, unfair practices. We've seen the targeting of American executives in some cases. We've seen, um, we've seen an unwillingness to cooperate. We've seen theft. But none of that really dissuades businesses from wanting still to get into that, that, that market, that to get either the benefits of cheap labor and cheap labor are unencumbered by the, uh, by the problems of unions, because if there's anything the CCP hates, it's unions, and by, the, and by that possibility of customers. So, they're the, so on the one hand, this is a kind of rational incentive for American business and one that we have to address. Like, it's very hard to give up the possibility of profit. It's very hard to give up the possibility of a market. But on the other, we also have to look at the way that the CCP has targeted American businessmen specifically. That is that they have a very skilled and a very deliberate package of reaching out to and uh, massaging the egos of American businessmen. You arrive in Beijing, you go to the Shangri-La Hotel or what the, or the Mandarin Oriental, you're in a five-star, you are surrounded by pleasant young Chinese people who tell you how important you are, mm -hmm. how important the U.S.-China relationship is, how critical, how critical business is to that, how you, how there are extremists on both sides, but you can be the one who speaks to moderation, who becomes the bridge. And you come back and you say in D.C., oh, the Chinese are really such reasonable people. They, and you effectively turn yourself into a lobbyist for them. It's, and this is a very discernible phenomenon. It's one that's very hard to address because how do you, you stop? You can't stop people from going and having these friendly conversations. And in some ways, these friendly conversations are useful. But it's something that, we, that I think we have to be aware of and we have to think about how do we close this gap between where business is and where, and where politics is. Well, thanks for that, James. Um, Senator Urso, um, maybe if you could give us a perspective, as you've heard from both gentlemen here, uh, from an EU perspective on China's coercive uh, economic practices from both a governmental and a business standpoint. Innanzitutto vi ringrazio per l'invito e mi scuso con voi se preferisco parlare Thanks for the invitation and I prefer to speak in Italian if you allow it. Io conosco l'America dal 1995 quando I know America since 1995. Appena eletto fu invitato al Dipartimento di Stato a fare una visita istruttiva negli Stati Uniti. When as soon as I entered politics in Italy, I was invited by the uh, US Department of State to come here and visit. Uh, e in quella visita durata un mese chiesi di conoscere anche il sistema delle fondazioni. I was here uh, for a month. Uh, in the U.S., and I was uh, very willing to know how the world of foundations here functioned. E ho incontrai in quell'occasione America Enterprise. And in that occasion, I uh, had the pleasure to meet and to know uh, the American Enterprise Institute. Poi nella mia attività politica di governo, in my uh, activity as a politician in Italy, ho rappresentato anche il governo italiano al vertice del WTO del 2001 nel Qatar. I represented the Italian government at the uh, uh, WTO uh, meeting in Qatar in 2021. Che decise l'ingresso della Cina nel WTO. 2001, sorry, which decided the uh, uh, accession of China in the WTO. E un minuto dopo, nello stesso tavolo, all'ingresso di Taiwan nel WTO. And just one minute later, there was the accession of Taiwan in the same organization. Parliamo del novembre del 2001. We are speaking about November 2001. Poche settimane dopo l'11 di settembre. Just some weeks after uh, uh, 9-11. Mentre gli aerei dell'alleanza andavano a bombardare l'Afghanistan. Uh, just when, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, planes of the uh, Western Alliance were uh, bombing Af Afghanistan. In quel momento... La minaccia principale all'umanità era il terrorismo islamico Al-Qaeda. In that moment, the main threat to humanity uh, was uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, uh, Islamic-driven terrorism. E il mondo si convinse giustamente di coinvolgere anche la Cina 
nel processo di globalizzazione perché anche la Cina in qualche misura notava il, il pericolo della minaccia islamica. So at that time everyone was very uh, uh, happy and willing to include China uh, as a partner in the fight against terrorism because it seemed uh, and it was even uh, 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 real actually that China was very willing to help uh, the West in its fight against terrorism. Da ministro del commercio estero italiano in un governo di destra. Since the start of uh, the Italian uh, international trade uh, with a, uh, a right-led government in Italy. Ho fatto decine di missioni in Cina con centinaia e migliaia di imprenditori italiani. I have made a lot of missions and trips to China with uh, Italian uh, businessmen. Perché in quel momento e per circa altri vent'anni noi abbiamo pensato, ci siamo illusi, che attraverso la tecnologia e la globalizzazione su questi binari passasse anche il treno delle libertà che da occidente giungeva ad oriente. Because since that moment on we had an illusion unfortunately that uh, uh, there was you know, the possibility to uh, improve uh, relations with China and to have uh, a, a very important uh, trade partnership between West and East. La tecnologia, cioè la, la tecnologia, cioè la rete, il villaggio globale, dove tutti potessero partecipare e discutere. So technology as a, a means to uh, include everyone in the same uh, uh, bigger um, world uh, trade uh, organization or uh, system, uh, including a lot of uh, uh, countries and nations. I social, Facebook, Twitter, la rete. So social media and uh, you know, uh, other, other um, uh, systems were important to uh, you know, include and, in, and improve this system. In cui ciascuno poteva esprimere le proprie opinioni, cinese, americano, italiano. Everyone was able with these systems and platforms, flat, platforms sorry, to express his opinion. In Cina come in Russia. In Cina as in Russia e la globalizzazione come libertà di mercato delle imprese. So globalization was seen by basically everyone as a way to uh, build a, a huge and peaceful globalization. E per vent'anni questo è accaduto. And this was the story of the last 20 years. Poi improvvisamente il treno si è fermato. Then uh, all of a sudden the train uh, uh, just stopped ed è tornato indietro. And is now moving backward. Cioè è caduto nell'anno 2013. This happened actually in 2013. Quando in Russia si è sviluppata la dottrina di Gerasimov. When in Russia Gerasimov doctrine uh, became the main lens through which l'attuale capo di stato so maggiore della difesa russa. Gerasimov is now the chief of staff of Russia defense. E in Cina è avvenuto l'ascesa al potere di Xi Jinping. And in the same uh, period Xi Jinping was uh, ascending as the main leader in China. Io ero diventato molto amico del suo oppositore storico, Bo Xilai. I was a close friend of his main uh, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> of his main uh, adversary politically speaking, uh, Bo Xilai. Bo Xilai. Mm-hmm. Quindi conosco le dinamiche interne. So I know pretty well Chinese internal dynamics. Xi Jinping ha cambiato lo statuto del Partito Comunista Cinese, inserendo nel preambolo la via della seta come via per il dominio globale. Xi Jinping ha changed uh, the main manifesto of the uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party by inserting uh, the idea of the Belt and Road Initiative as the main driver of Chinese foreign policy. Perché in Cina il diritto è innanzitutto quello del partito. Because in China now the main right is that of the, is that is the one of the party. Poi ha cambiato la Costituzione cinese. Then he has changed the Chinese constitution. Poi ha cambiato la legge sulla sicurezza nazionale. 
then he has changed the law on national security. Che tra l'altro prevede che qualunque cittadino cinese e qualunque impresa cinese nel mondo ha l'obbligo di fornire informazioni al proprio sistema di sicurezza. This law uh, provides that every uh, person doing business in China and also Chinese company have an obligation to provide information on how they operate to the Chinese government. Xi Jinping ha poi fatto un progetto di riarmo. Then there has been a huge program of rearmament in China. Fino a quel momento gli investimenti nelle armi in Cina erano ridotti al lumicino. And until that moment actually uh, Chinese spending in weapons and weaponry were, was pretty low actually. Xi Jinping ha costruito portaerei sommergibili. So new aircraft carriers, uh, new submergibles basi militari lungo la via della seta come a Djibouti and uh, a lot of military bases uh, um, along the Belt and Road initiatives in many countries especially in key countries in Africa uh, such as Djibouti ha fatto un progetto di rivendicazioni territoriali lungo tutto il Pacifico he has also a program of uh, closer relations with countries uh, in the Pacific area And this means also a way to uh, create Chinese bases there. Ha annesso Hong Kong. He annexed Hong Kong. Cancellando libertà di Hong Kong. Uh, erasing basically the rights of Hong Kong people. E promette che prenderà anche Taiwan. And is promising uh, that he will take over uh, Taiwan. Quando Xi Jinping venga in Italia nel 2018 per firmare l'accordo sulla via della seta. When he came in Italy uh, in 2018 to sign uh, the memorandum of understanding on the Belt and Road Initiative with Italy, l'unico think tank che realizzò un meeting contro quella firma fu il think tank che io presiedo fare futuro. The only think tank in Italy that actually opposed that signing was my think tank, the one I'm leading. Um, what's the name? Think Tank, Fare Futuro. Uh, you know, Fare Futuro, which means doing My do in the future, which is a foundation. Lo stesso giorno in cui Gigi Pink arrivava in Italia, nell'aula della Camera, noi facemmo un convegno sulla politica di potenza imperialista della Cina, invitando il nostro paese a non firmare quell'accordo. In the same day when Xi Jinping was in the Chamber of Representatives in Italy, we made this... Uh, important convening uh, with my foundation to uh, um, push the government and to ask the government not to sign that uh, agreement. E però io sono la stessa persona che ho firmato l'accordo nel WTO per l'ingresso della Cina. But I am also the same person that in 2001 was very happy to, to support China accession to the WTO. Quando l'ambasciatore cinese fu audito dalle nostre commissioni, when the Chinese ambassador was uh, uh, you know speaking with our commissions, io ho detto chiaramente non sono cambiato io, siete cambiati voi. Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I was not the one who changed, but actually you are the one uh, who have changed. Mi accusava di aver fatto parlare nell'aula del Senato in teleconferenza Washa Wong. I was accused uh, by the Chinese representative uh, because I was uh, supportive of uh, a Chinese... Uh, uh, Washa Wong. Washa Wong. Il leader del Partito Democratico di Hong Kong che ora è in carcere. The leader of the Democratic Party of Hong Kong which, who is now uh, in jail. And I was happy to let him speak. E gli ho detto con chiarezza che io oggi mi occupo della Cina in maniera così pervasiva. And I told him that I now, uh, I'm now focusing a lot on China. Più del passato. More than in the past. Perché oggi, per, e mi occupo dei figli degli Uguri, di Hong Kong, di Taipei. I look at a lot of important issues regarding China, such as the Uguri issue and uh, Taipei as well. Perché la Cina è oggi nelle condizioni di diventare la superpotenza globale. 
because China is today poised to become uh, the major global power. Non una delle superpotenze, ma la l'unica superpotenza globale. Not one of many superpowers, but the one. La Russia è una minaccia perché vuole tornare ad essere un impero. Russia is of course a threat because it wants to become or go back as ma where un, it was as an empire. Ma uno degli imperi. But just one of many empires. La Cina è l'unica potenza in grado di diventare l'unico impero. China is the only country now who has the power to become an empire. Pericolo tanto più grave perché Xi Jinping non è più il primo tra il politburo cinese. This is even more uh, dangerous because now Xi Jinping is not the only one who thinks this thing uh, in the uh, Chinese politburo. Ma è l'unico. Non è il primo, ma è l'unico. Is the only one, but is not the first. Perché ha abolito il limite di mandato che Deng Xiaoping aveva posto dei due mandati. Because he has increased uh, the number of mandates that this leader can uh, uh, use. And e può essere rieletto a vita. And can be reelected uh, throughout all his life. La stessa cosa ha fatto Putin in Russia. The same thing is doing Putin in Russia now. E infatti nel novembre di quest'anno col congresso del Partito Comunista, Xi Jinping verrà rieletto per la terza volta. And in fact, this year it's very likely that Xi Jinping will be re-elected for the third time. Ha preso il sopravvento anche sul partito. And now he's controlling the party even more strongly. E questo è il vero pericolo. And this is the real uh, danger now. Per cui noi dobbiamo essere molto attenti perché la tecnologia e la globalizzazione che erano i binari delle libertà sono diventati gli strumenti dei sistemi autocratici, dittatoriali, imperialisti. So now we have to be very careful because uh, what it was once the binary of cooperation at the international level, uh, technology and globalization are now uh, the instruments of power for author authoritarian countries. I may interject there just for a second. Um, so, so, Senator, th uh, appreciate your perspective on that. As you alluded to, as um, President Xi goes for a third term and, and solidifies his grip on power in the convention this fall, I guess as we look at, um, from a public policy standpoint, from the United States perspective, uh, and the EU perspective, you know, we've looked at a number of different things. We've, we've heard a lot about decoupling and reshoring and what does that mean and where we've been successful on that. Secondly, we've talked about uh, TPP, very controversial, Trans-Pacific Partnership, trade agreement with our like-minded allies and kind of surrounding China. Of course, that didn't pass. Um, the phase one deal that was negotiated under the Trump administration was really a purchase agreement didn't have a lot of teeth to it when it came to enforcement mechanisms. So, and, and as I referenced earlier, we have this bill in the, in the Senate right now, or in a conference committee on figuring out where to go. So maybe opening it up uh, to the panel again, from a public policy standpoint, are there success stories on decoupling or reshoring that we can look at as an example? And in what direction should we be going on trade? James or Derek? Or? Yes, sir. So I'd say that to some extent, the anti-Huawei measures were a success. Um, you know, you had this one very prominent, very um, closely government-connected Chinese company that was the target of a uh, whole round of measures by the US. Now, it's still very difficult to detach Huawei technology from US systems and EU systems, even when there's been the promise of that. Um, it's, so, it's become so embedded, and this process always takes a long time. Ironically, on the Chinese side, you know, they've been trying to switch from using Windows to using a homegrown um, Chinese desktop OS for 20 years without success. There's still, the um, vast majority of the Chinese government still runs on, on Western software. Um, so this is a, both an indication of something that's possible and of the difficulty of the process, that just untangling all these bits that go down to sort of, you know, state-level um, commitments to Huawei, buys from Huawei in the past, is really hard. But Huawei also provided us with some very useful models for sanctions 
that have been, um, and sanctions tools that have been revitalized and used um, against Russia uh, in these cases. So there's also an, a degree to which by targeting, honing in specifically, we're able to see what tools work, to see what kind of packages can be put together. But I'd say, ironically, the most successful kind of uh, decoupling is driven by the Chinese government itself. It's driven by the internal paranoia of the Chinese government about American influence, about American cultural um, and economic infiltration and how closely uh, our economies are tied together. Because while we tend to see that as a source of strength for the Chinese, they're also quite aware of it as a weakness. And post-Ukraine in particular, we've seen a doubling down on measures inside China design that are aimed at attempting to snip some of these ties. And we've seen it very strongly on the cultural front, for instance, in that you know, um, Hollywood for years was kind of the, the prime example of an American industry that was completely, would do basically whatever Beijing said in order to get access. But so few movies are getting permission to get into China now that this is starting to have a effect in Hollywood. And so this brings a kind of a, a dangerous strategy that we that could be adopted. Like, do we, in fact, encourage these autarctic, these paranoid tendencies on the Chinese front in order to create these decoupling when it comes also with the risk of great power conflict, when the people who push forward these measures are also the people who see the hand of the CIA everywhere, who believe that China is being deliberately encircled, who believe that China may have to strike back in order to free itself from the grip of America. Um, and so what I think that, while I think we can recognize that Chinese paranoia is there and can be very useful in terms of pushing a decoupling agenda, it's also a little bit playing with fire uh, and there are aspects in which we want to discourage this paranoia. Where the idea would be, the, the idea really would, would be for them to be economically paranoid but militarily trusting, but I don't think that's going to happen. The two are so inevitably linked together. Thank you for that. Derek, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, just a quick response to James and then to your question. Um, I don't think we're going to get Xi Jinping to change his behavior. There were a lot of people who thought he was a reformer in 2012 and 2013. Right. I'm in print at the time saying, you guys are out of your minds. Uh, they were out of their minds. People now saying, oh, after the party congress, he'll be better. He'll be what he's been his entire career, which is a very repressive status with d dreams of grandeur. So uh, I don't think we're going to be able to manage his paranoia. China's paranoia is not really hard. It's not, it's not very easy to separate from, from his own paranoia. We're just going to have to accept it. Uh, it's unpleasant. It's dangerous. But that's the way the world is and will be until he's no longer in charge. With regard to your question, uh, sir, um, I would go back to CFIUS reform. Uh, CFIUS is Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Um, we had a, the, the bill was ultimately passed 85 to 10 in the Senate and 400 to 2 in the House. I always tell the joke that if you introduced a measure in the House that American mothers are the best mothers, it still wouldn't get 400 to 2 passage. So this was a really bipartisan uh, uh, event. And we had a lot of people saying we're worried about overreach, which was a legitimate concern. Uh, that mostly got handled, certainly at the congressional level. And we had people saying, oh, this is going to be terrible for the United States if we have a stronger national security protection on inbound investment. And it wasn't, it didn't harm us at all. Um, oh, sorry, a little too fast. I'm getting agitated again. Um, and the reason I'm getting agitated is because we're recreating some of those arguments with, now with regard to outbound investment and supply chains, in particular a piece of legislation that is in the House version competes not in the Senate version, USICA, originally sponsored by Senators Casey and Cornyn, so bipartisan, and with bipartisan sponsors in the House. It is absolutely possible that that bill or any other China bill can overreach. But what we hear sometimes in opposition is the same thing we heard in regard to CFIUS reform. You don't understand how terrible this is going to be. False. It is not going to be terrible. These are inalienable rights of American corporations. Also false. Um, we weren't allowed to invest in the Warsaw Pact. We're not allowed to invest now in North Korea and Iran. What we have you know, in opposition to this is genuine, legitimate caution and people saying, you're not allowed to interfere with us making money. Um, and that is not the national interest. It's the interest of, of, of some companies to be considered. But we saw with CFIUS reform, this can be done right. 
It can be done with bipartisan support. It did not hurt the United States economically. And even the people who opposed it, you don't hear this, oh my goodness, this was so terrible. Um, so I think there is a way forward for other actions looking at that model where you have to be careful about overreach, but perhaps some of the hysterics from the business community can be set aside. Thanks for that, Derek. Um, I want to open it up for questions or comments. I know we have some online questions here, but uh, for the audience, uh, for questions for any of the panelists. Oh, yeah. Peter Sommer. Um I can do the question both in Italian and English. Uh, the other monitors, not only also, and my question for Congressman uh, uh, LaHood. Uh, Peter Sommer with Capital Intelligence, um, CIA Ukraine. Uh, my question is about secondary sanctions. We're seeing sanction violations in Qatar, UAE, China, you know, companies that are, you know, Rosten, for example, in Italy, they took, uh, Bank Intesa did the deal of, of um, selling a 20% stake of the Russian oil company to the Qataris uh, right after 2014. We're seeing similar sanction breaking some, by other European companies, you know, Caterpillar, but in UAE, Qatar. No, è sulla la um, sanzioni secondarie o cosa farà Italia e Stati Uniti per evitare queste uh, attività e poi il beneficio maggiore sono cinesi. So it seems to be the biggest uh, uh, benefit, the person, the country that benefits the most from sanction breaking is China, the Russian China. What would you do now and how can you work together as Italy's our closest ally, you know, NATO and closest ally on the Ukraine sanctions? Thank you. Go ahead, Senator Urso, do you want to answer? L'Italia ha recepito appieno tutte le misure sanzionatorie che insieme agli altri partner europei ha deciso nei confronti della Russia. Italy has, uh, you know, uh, provided support and is in line with what uh, its allies have decided regarding the sanctions uh, against Russia and is perfectly uh, integrated within this uh, package of sanctions. Sia quelle riferite appunto al commercio, agli investimenti russi, alle imprese italiane hanno di fatto lasciato la Russia. Both those regarding uh, enterprise, Italian enterprises operating in Russia. O ne stanno programmando via via l'uscita. And these enterprises have, you know, uh, is now, are now living in Russia and or are planning to do so in, in the near future e ha provveduto al sequestro dei patrimoni degli investimenti degli oligarchi nel nostro paese. But at the same time has also uh, uh, been fast in uh, you know take the uh, uh, all the possessions of Russian oligarchs in Italy. Credo che il patrimonio più importante in gente sia stato proprio sequestrato in Italia. And I think one of the biggest of these uh, huge possessions were uh, in fact uh, um, uh, you know, taken by Italian authorities. Ha inoltre programmato l'uscita dal gas, dalla dipendenza del gas russo nei prossimi 18 mesi. Italy is also planning to leave uh, the, uh, uh, its energy um, uh, relations with Russia uh, in 18 months from now. L'Italia importa il 40% del gas dalla Russia. But you have to bear in mind that Italy was uh, dependent for more of 40% on its energy needs from Russia. Ma già nel 13 gennaio di quest'anno il comitato che presiedo, in una relazione al Parlamento sulla sicurezza energetica, 40 giorni prima dell'invasione in Ucraina, chiedeva all'Italia di liberarsi dalla dipendenza dal gas russo. But even one month before Russian invasion of Ukraine, my committee was already presenting uh, the Italian Parliament with a document, uh, uh, you know, uh, stressing the need to uh, diminish its reliance on Russia energy sources. Lo faremo, questo avrà un costo per il Paese. There will be huge costs for Italy. Sarebbe opportuno che gli Stati Uniti si rendessero conto e agissero per ripartire in maniera equa i costi delle sanzioni. And so, for this reason, uh, I'm here to stress the need uh, for the U.S. to support Europe and European countries in their uh, endeavor to diminish their reliance on energy sources, which is very difficult for, for us. Perché se, se ciò non dovesse accadere, 
se l'opinione pubblica italiana comprendesse che noi paghiamo un costo molto elevato, più elevato di qualunque altro paese, sarebbe difficile tenere il fronte interno. It will be very difficult uh, to maintain our current support uh, um, in, in, the, in the current situation if the, uh, our partners internationally are not uh, uh, helping us in doing so. Sulle sanzioni secondarie sulla Cina, ovviamente, ove necessario dovrebbero essere prese, ma è un problema molto diverso. Uh, secondary sanctions, when, when it comes to China, are kind of different uh, problem, actually. Perché la Cina è ovunque. Because China is everywhere. E anche in, negli Stati Uniti. And is also very present in the United States, by the way. Isolare la Cina sul piano economico è praticamente impossibile. So, isolating China uh, from an economic standpoint is very difficult. Aveva visto giu giusto McCain quando si candidò la prima volta contro Obama. And I think uh, McCain was actually uh, very straightforward when he uh, first, uh, uh, you know, was running for presidency against Obama. Quando allora già proponeva l'alleanza dei popoli democratici anche attraverso un bacino commerciale integrato tra l'Europa e l'Atlantico comune. When he was uh, suggesting the need to create a, a shared uh, trade you know, union uh, between uh, uh, the US and Europe, mm -hmm. so from a transatlantic perspective. E quello che oggi saremo costretti a fare. And I think this is what we are now forced to do yep. today. Maybe I'll comment on the specific question on, on, as it relates to sanctions. Um, a couple things on that. We've looked at this on the Intelligence Committee as you look at the conflict in Ukraine. Um, obviously, the implementation of the sanctions and the enforcement of the sanctions are vitally important uh, to, to the conflict. Um, and, and to your point, there are violations and there are deficiencies, and, and I think we're working to remedy those. If you look at um, the sanctions that we put in place against Iran, uh, and, and they were very, very successful. Now, it's a little bit different situation with, with Russia now, but there has to be consequences to the violation of the sanctions, and, and China has not felt those consequences in my view on that. Uh, and so as we continue to observe and see how they do that, uh, I think uh, consequences from the administration are gonna be important. Unfortunately, that's the only thing that China understands. Now, say what you want about, I'm not generally a fan of tariffs, but the tariffs that were implemented by President Trump got the attention of the Chinese, right? I, I, I'm not one to want to get into a trade war, but when you put consequences like tariffs in place, um, those have a real world effect on it. And similar to the sanctions enforcement mechanism, I think you have to have that. And I, you know, we'll see what happens with this administration on it. Um, as you might have seen earlier this week, um, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, met with his counterpart from China. They had a four and a half hour meeting and talked specifically about the violation of the sanctions. If there is not you know, proper uh, enforcement of that or follow up on that, I think there will be consequences. And the role that Congress can play on that, a lot of that is done by the administration, but I think we're ready and willing and able to, to get involved. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Yeah, in the back there. Um, hi, thank you so much for speaking to us today. I was wondering if we do a Cold War policy with China on the business side, um, does that kind of, is there a possibility that that lowers their inhibitions and all of a sudden the Belt and Road Initiative is much more active and they're much more aggressive on the South China Sea? And if so, is there any plan to combat that or what do you, what do you propose we do about that? I'll have these guys come. I would just say, I think one of the best things the Biden administration has done thus far is AUKUS, uh, the agreement with the Australians uh, on, on the nuclear submarine deal. That got the attention of the Chinese. We need to be more involved uh, from a geopolitical standpoint. This is my own view. Geopolitical standpoint, from a military standpoint, we have to be more robust when it comes to the South China Sea in, in the Indo-Pacific region. So that's a step in the right direction in terms of being more forceful. 
As you've seen the military pivot, uh, you know, for the last 20 years, we were heavily involved in terrorism post 9-11. You're now seeing a switch in the military, uh, and which will take a while, but looking at, you know, uh, supporting uh, the South Pacific and building up our military there, building up our Navy, uh, we, we've seen a pivot there that I think will be beneficial towards that. On, on the Belt and Road Initiative, I mean, uh, you know, uh, China thrives on, you know, on uh, dictators and authoritarian regimes, right? That, that's where they go in and sell Huawei and sell their surveillance systems uh, to keep kind of those dictators and authoritarians in power. I, I think the Belt and Road Initiative is going to continue to go down the road, but it's had mixed opinions, the Belt and Road uh, you know, initiative, right? I mean, there's many examples in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa and other places where the Chinese uh, have been run off because of their policies they put in place. So anyway, I'll let uh, either of these guys answer on that. Uh, I guess I'll go first this time. I think you're raising an important general point. I'm not really worried about the Belt and Road in terms of the U.S. As the congressman just said, there is harm to local countries that can be done by this alliance between dictators uh, and, and Chinese state-owned enterprises. Um, but the Belt and Road has actually shrunk in size in the last few years. Um, I do think your general point is, is well taken. Uh, the Department of Defense has reported in the last few months that predatory Chinese policy, starting with the theft of IP, and then I'll add in um, subsidies to scale up Chinese competition, has undermined supply chains in the U.S. defense industrial base. So we're not just talking about your phone. We're talking about things that we need to defend our interests internationally, including possibly against China. Uh, and what that means is, if we were to get into a conflict with the Chinese, there is an element of economic coercion there that they can inflict upon us. Um, and and to, to get to the point of your question, if we are going, as I think we should, because I think we're facing a cult of personality dictator, to, to adopt a more confrontational posture with China and say, no, your behavior has not been acceptable, um, and we're going to have to take, make sacrifices to get you to change, we have to be ready. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure that we are. Um, you're saying that if we reduce, uh, I, I take your point, you're saying that if we reduce our economic uh, engagement with China, they may become more willing to take risks. And I do want to reduce our economic engagement with China because I think it's hurt, it's hurt the U.S. in a lot of ways, for example, in the defense industrial base. I don't want to eliminate it. I want to reduce it. And if they are more willing to take risks, are we ready for that? Um, so I would add an element to your question. There are some things we should do to strengthen the United States that may cause a Chinese reaction, and we need to be prepared for that reaction. And the, the most, the, not the only example, but the most dramatic example is the standoff over Taiwan. If we were to get into a conflict with China over Taiwan, um, the, the damage caused by the Russia Ukraine, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine to supply chains would be dwarfed in comparison. And I'm not sure the US is ready for that. James? Just to pick up on what Dick said, I think there's this. I, I think that um, we, see, we see constant talk from China in response to any U.S. action. We see, um, this, we see this kind of extreme rhetoric, increasingly extreme, from state media, from officials, through wolf warrior diplomacy. And there's a degree to which I think we, we've kind of come to not take that as seriously as we should, mm -hmm. because it's often not followed up on. But it is, in fact... While it is shit-talking, to a large degree, while they are basically just trolling... Is that a technical term? That's a technical it's term. That's not a word we approve of here. The, uh, you know, I, like to, I like to just to, to throw, to throw a, little, you know, a, a little of the Chinese language in there. But they, they, um, there's, this, there's, this, uh, they, there's this stuff that's aimed at their bosses, essentially. This stuff that's aimed at showing they're tough, at showing to Xi Jinping they're tough, this working towards the Fuhrer that drives the system at the moment. But it does also point to our weaknesses, and we're not doing enough about that. When they say, when they say we will cut, you know, we could cut off rare earth processing, we could, that we could sever, sever farmer supply chains, all this kind of thing, they almost never actually do it. They haven't done it, but they could do it, and they're thinking about it. And we should be, and every time we hear this, we should be acting to reshore those chains in a much more serious way and looking towards the possibility of this maybe not happening this time, but happening the next time or the time after when, the, when there's U.S.-China conflict. Um, I don't worry about Belt and Road. Belt and Road is a, more or less a massive white elephant at this point. It's become a huge kind of domestic political concern in China. What I do worry about and what I think is a concern is we can't just think in terms of China's success 
in reaching out to authoritarian states and dictatorships. China is very good at reaching out to the developing world in general. And it's good at reaching out to the developing world because the Chinese system treats those countries with a respect that the United States and the West does not necessarily give them. It, gi it gives their leaders direct meetings with Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. It builds up a core of diplomats who, from early in their career, train in specific, um, often quite small languages, uh, in order to, to have a deep knowledge of that culture and that region. It's excellent at that. It's why it has consistently outperformed the US in African diplomacy, for instance. And so, we, and so while we can recognize that there's some authoritarian sympathy, we can't think of it in just in terms of that's what's giving China the edge there. We have to take Chinese diplomatic skills seriously and think about how we can order our own systems in response as well. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Unfortunately, I have to leave uh, soon for uh, another engagement. But I'd like to express a couple of issues uh, uh, together with your, uh, uh, what you've said so far. Il primo è che per quanto ci riguarda è importante una politica occidentale per l'Africa. The first one is that uh, from our perspective and for the US uh, as well, it's very important to create and establish uh, a sound uh, policy uh, for Africa. Perché i paesi africani oggi sono di fatto sottomessi alla Cina e alla Russia. Uh, first, because currently China and Russia are really uh, doing a lot of business in Africa and are strengthening their position in, in, uh, in Africa. Il secondo concetto è che credo che l'Occidente debba sviluppare una autonomia strategica. And the second one is uh, because the West uh, needs to improve its strategic autonomy and especially Europe. Nei settori a più alta innovazione tecnologica. In sectors uh, such as high-hand technologies per assumere appunto una propria indipendenza in tutte quelle aree, per esempio dell'economia digitale, dell'economia ecologica, in tutti quei settori produttivi in cui noi dobbiamo garantire alle nostri popoli una appunto autonomia generale. Uh, to uh, strengthen all these sectors uh, ranging from uh, uh, space technology, uh, green technology, um, where we need to create our autonomy in order to uh, not be uh, uh, you know, uh, taken over by China in the future. La filiera produttiva, dalle materie prime al prodotto finale, deve essere garantito all'interno delle democrazie occidentali. So all the process uh, of high-hand technology from the uh, uh, development to the production phase must be uh, uh, kept within West control. In tutti i settori strategici. In all strategic sectors. Thanks. Thank you. Questions? I have one uh, online question here. Actually, I don't know if Senator Urso is, is here. Are you leaving? See, yes, he's leaving. All right, sounds good. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Thank you. Um, Whoa. Uh, any other questions from, from the audience um, for either Derek or James? Go ahead, sir. Uh, good morning. So, I was just, of course, there's a lot of talk about engaging the Quad from a security perspective, and it's something I really support. But uh, coming from an Indian perspective and looking at how the Indian government sees this, they're not as comfortable uh, having it as an explicit anti-China alliance on the security side of things, because the last thing they want is to be drawn into a conflict over Taiwan, with, which involves the United States and China. So. When it comes, so I was just thinking of ways to reframe the Quad as a more of an economic alliance and using economic means to engage Quad allies in when on reshoring supply chains and strengthening trade relationships. Considering how the CPTPP seems to be going nowhere at the moment. 
Well, I, I think you raise a number of interesting points as it relates to our trade policy. And, and to your point, obviously, India plays a, a vital role in, in the Indo-Pacific region. And, and we need to continue to cultivate that relationship uh, and from an economic standpoint. Um, as you know, it's been tough to, to break through the, the bureaucracy of India sometimes from a, I think that's an understatement, from an economic and a, and a business standpoint, right? But, but obviously there's tremendous opportunity there. And so, yeah, I mean, I think you have to think strategically um, and, and it all ties into national security, right? But when we talk about supply chain, I mean, I always use the example at the height of the pandemic, um, we, we were 95% reliant on Chinese, on the Chinese for PPE, for reagents, for generic drugs, for pharmaceutical drugs, 95%. And so, you know, again, uh, we're going to have another health, health crisis in this country at some point. So figuring out how do we reshore that? How do we bring supply chains back? We're having that conversation right now with the CHIPS Act, right, on semiconductors, right? Uh, as you look at the state-owned investment by the Chinese when it comes to semiconductors, I mean, they're building out for the next 30 years. They want to be the dominant player when it comes to semiconductors. So the bill that's been introduced that we're debating in Congress, right, uh, would, would change the narrative on that. And, and, you know, again, lots of folks on both sides of the aisle that, that believe this is a national security issue as we look to the future. And so we're having those conversations but we have to have action at some point on the supply chain issue and where we can look to India. I mean, from a free trade standpoint, the Ways and Means Committee has looked at India. But, it, you know, you look at the free trade agreements we've engaged in, uh, USMCA, for example, Mexico and Canada, 28 chapters that lay out how you trade. To get India on the same page with us, I mean, we're, we're years away from that right now. Doesn't mean we shouldn't work for that. From a, again, uh, 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 intelligence standpoint, from a national security standpoint, we ought to be cultivating India, particularly because of their close relationship with Russia, as we saw with the UN security vote, and they supported, or were neutral, I guess, when it, when it came to supporting Putin. So anyway, I've talked too much. You guys comment on that. I just have a quick comment. I'm not an expert on Indian politics and security, but you know, I see some of the paralysis in India that I feel like we face here, uh, only worse. Um, we have not been in a, a, a violent conflict with China. China is not trying to change the border situation with the United States. Um, and it is with India. And India is very dependent on China economically, as its leaders are aware. And yet, when the United States approaches India, we're told, oh, whoa, 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 we don't want to be you know, too friendly to you. I'm like, OK, if that's the call, then you can make that call. But it's, it's hard from the outside to understand why when you have a serious border dispute with a, with a dangerous country, right? It's not like having a serious border dispute with, with Nepal, no offense to Nepal, just saying it's a lot worse than that. And you have a lot of economic dependence on that country and you have partners who want to reduce their dependence on that country and your dependence on that country. And it's not just the Indian bureaucracy. The Indian government's like, well, you know, that's all nice, but we have our own economic path. And, and that's fine. India is allowed to choose its own economic path. It doesn't seem to want to, to make any difficult decisions to work with others. Um, and this is a situation where India is much more economically dependent on China than the United States. So the idea of being economically dependent on the United States is, is, is a little bit far-fetched. So I, of course, agree with the congressman. India is a great prize in terms of US foreign policy. But I, I think the first step has to be an Indian government that says we're willing to, to make a to shift in response to the way the world has changed. James, any thoughts? So just very quickly to speak to the, the military side of things, I think you're right in that India doesn't want to have this military discussion. And in part, that's because the Indian military establishment is this bizarre mixture of hmm. naive, uh, oh, and overconfident and terrified of China. <laughs> and this is a really hard line to walk, walk because simultaneously you'll get them claiming that they could, this sort of, you know, our boys, exaggerated, we're all sort of familiar with, unfortunately, the, 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 the degree to which military rhetoric can get overtalked. Um, you know, we'd, we'd send them running back to Beijing in an afternoon mm -hmm. and, oh my God, they're going to completely overwhelm us. <laughs> and there seems to be very little, I think the US can play an important role in helping India actually think about what a conflict would look like, because the Chinese are certainly thinking about it. Um, they've, put, as we know, poured so much effort into the Himalayas, mm -hmm. and we're seeing this you know, building out not just of the major conflict zones, but this quiet building out through Bhutan, through Nepal, these, this real establishment of like superior positions. And India is going to 
face that conflict at some point, like it or not, and it may be the United States' job to sort of, um, while talking about the economic aspects, to also shove India into recognizing that reality. Maybe uh, one last question, and then we're going to close it out here, if anybody's got a final question. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Tenzin Lodo, thank you for being here with us. Uh, my question is about Tibet. Uh, a few months ago, Freedom House uh, put out their uh, uh, annual um, list of the most restricted countries and regions in the world. North Korea came in second, and Syria and, and Tibet were uh, tied for number one. So my question is about what do you think the U.S. policies can be on Tibet from a humanitarian, a humanitarian standpoint with uh, being so restricted and also a geopolitical standpoint, given that U.S. Uh, the Tibet has uh, the water sources uh, provide almost 1.4 billion people, and from um, from that geopolitical standpoint, thank you. I'll go first just because I want to I want to tie your question back to the ostensible topic of the event, um, which is, you know, one of the reasons to fight Chinese economic warfare, to punish the recipients of stolen American intellectual property, not to let them just operate freely in the international marketplace when, when they're involved, have been involved in, a, in, a, in essentially a criminal activity, to strengthen U.S. supply chains. So as, as the senator said, we don't have high-tech supply chains that, that become dependent on China, is to allow us to make clear decisions about how to handle Chinese human rights violations. So when we think about Tibet, and I'm, I'm only giving you part of the, of, the, of the situation, no question, but I, wa I want to drive this home. When we think about Tibet, do we think about, is the actual situation in Tibet getting better or getting worse? What would be more effective in responding? Should we try to coerce the Chinese? Should we try to influence them in a positive way? But we get two steps into that, and somebody says, whoa, 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 the Chinese might retaliate against us economically. We can't do it. And so, you know, the congressman brought up this at the beginning, human rights, the military economics. Of course, I'm an economic determinist because that's my job. If we don't reduce China's leverage over us, we can't make the right choices. This bears to the question before about the BRI. We can't make the right choices with regard to Tibet. So just one angle on this. I think American policy toward Tibet would be improved if we were less worried about economic dependence on China. I mean, I think Derek's quite right, and I think of you know the 1970s when we were able to put pressure on the Soviet Union over human rights it, um, to a strong degree, uh, mostly because we didn't have this dependence. We didn't, and we had the economic leverage over the USSR. In fact, in most cases, um, and it's going to be a very difficult process to to get to anywhere near that stage. But the more the U.S. is able to operate without fear of retaliation, the more it's capable of, of acting on human rights. We've also seen, I think, in Xinjiang, you know, this example which I think you can argue both ways, in that on the one hand, China has responded to U.S. efforts um, through with, you know, um, vitriol and refusal to comply and the general op opacity of Chinese business so that it's effectively impossible to tell whether something uses slave labor or not because the the supply chains are all not so, so deliberately messed up. But on the other hand, it also ratcheted down the excesses in uh, Xinjiang from the very worst point to a point that is now merely very, 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 very bad <laughs> because of international attention and the attention being paid by the US. So I think that there's real value in coming at it from an economic standpoint and saying and doing things like the uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Act, I forget exactly what it's called mm -hmm. at this point, um, and thinking about those models for other places where, where oppression may be ratcheting up, as worryingly we've seen signs of in Tibet in the last sort of year or so, um, thinking about ways in which there is a value in just drawing attention to that in, in, in having officials and the government there know that uh, the outside world is focused on that. That can be useful in itself. Well, thank you, James, for that. Um, that, that brings a conclusion to our event today. We could have talked uh, all day on China, right? We didn't, we didn't talk much about Taiwan or Hong Kong or the Uyghurs uh, and, and, and lots of other issues. Um, but uh, let's give um, Derek and James a round of applause for their being here today. And again, I'm grateful uh, to AEI for putting this on. We look forward to coming back. Thank you, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for the fantastic discussion. And thank you, uh, Congressman, and to your, uh, to your colleague, Mike Turner, for your leadership on, on these issues. And, and of course, the, uh, the House Intelligence Committee. And it occurred to me, uh, I was, uh, as I was reading the notes before the event, that you represent 
uh, a district in Illinois of 710,000 people. And I sort of wondered how you managed to represent 710,000 people and worry about these things. But yeah. I concluded it comes together because, as you mentioned, with, with Caterpillar, these are not uh, abstract issues. China's unfair practices are not abstract issues that concern only foreign policy wonks and, and intelligence wonks. They concern every single one of us because we, uh, as ordinary citizens in our countries, Notice the difference when our country, when our companies uh, can't compete, or when they when they move their uh, parts of their supply chains, or even their manufacturing uh, to China because it's uh, advantageous for unfair reasons. So it all comes together, and, and so uh, it uh, benefits your constituents, uh, Mr. Turner's uh, constituents, and and indeed I think every citizen of this country and other Western countries that our legislators think about these things, legislators assisted by journalists and think tankers. Um, so thank you all for coming. And, uh, and I think this is just the beginning of a long conversation about how to combat China's unfair business practices. Thank you.